Hello, everyone, and welcome to day nine of the Level Up Symposium. My name is Andrew Scriver, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to Smile, presented by the Associated Designers of Canada with support from Toaster Lab's Mixed Reality Performance Atelier. I am one of the co-curators of the symposium and a member of the ADC, and I am very excited to be your host for this event. I would like to first acknowledge that I am coming to you from the settler city of Montreal, which long before the colonizers arrived was a place of conference, conflict, and creativity for many Indigenous peoples, including the Anishinaabe, the Huron-Wendat, the Abenaki peoples. This land is known by the current caretakers of the land, the Ganyangahaga Nation, as Chachage, which means broken in two because of the way the river bends around the island. I'm honored and humbled to, to be able to be here to share and create with you all, and so I offer my thanks. In the spirit of gratitude, I would like to acknowledge the support of the Canada Council for the Arts, our primary supporter of the symposium as a whole, as well as our other sponsors, who are IATSE, uh, the University of British Columbia, Theatre Alberta, the CITT Alberta Chapter, Concordia University, Ryerson University, York University, and of course, all of our individual donors. Thank you very much. Uh, for your information, all of our symposium events will be recorded and presented in a freely available archive on our website within a few days of the event. So thank you for joining us today. If you are watching this live stream either on the Level Up website, which is levelup.designers.ca, on HowlRound at HowlRound.com, or through our partners at Toaster Lab, or on the respective Facebook pages of the ADC or Toaster Lab. Regardless of your viewing platform, embedded on the same page of the video is a chat function in the upper right-hand corner of your video. Uh, you can click on the little speech bubble at any time and type in any questions that you have for the presenter. Uh, at the time, later time, I will read out to, uh, to our presenter. Uh, this event can be enjoyed through auditory or visual access or a combination of both. I, of course, as I said, will read aloud all the questions that are addressed from the chat and this uh, information will appear visually at the bottom of the screen. Uh, visual access is also supported with captioning, as you can see at the bottom of the screen, uh, for all speakers. If you uh, require technical assistance to support your access, please email levelup at designers.ca for immediate support or at any time to provide feedback after the event. If you enjoyed this session or any of the other sessions of the Level Up Symposium, please consider donating any amount to the Associated Designers of Canada to help our National Arts Service Organization in it's achieving its goals of advocacy, mentorship, and industry promotion. Donation links are available on all viewing platforms, so on our Level Up website, the ADC's website, or canadahelps.org. Uh, so please consider donating. Thank you for your patience with all of our announcements. Uh, it's now my incredible honor to welcome our guest to the, of the event. Uh, Brittany Bland is a storyteller who has dedicated her life to the proliferation of empathy. As a projection designer for the stage, she has created theater, dance, and opera. Her work as a video artist often explores the ideas of legacy, memory, and empathy. Originally from Atlanta, Georgia, now based in New Haven, Connecticut, she holds a BA in technical theater and production from Catawba College and an MFA in design from the Yale School of Drama. Welcome, Brittany. Hi, Andrew. Thank you for that. Of course. Very happy to have you here. Yes, it's great to be here. So uh, yeah, I'd love, I just want to love, I'd love to start this off and sort of throw it at you. Can you tell me what you've been doing during the pandemic and what's been really exciting, something you've discovered along the way that's really uh, excited you about? <laughs> um, uh, the, the biggest discovery of the pandemic has been uh, free time. And, <laughs> and uh, I've also actually taken on uh, a ficus plant, which uh, grew rapidly <laughs> over the summer. Um, <laughs> that, that's been like one of my uh, happiest endeavors, um, and getting to actually kind of like spend time to reconnect with the, the people that I care about during this time that is, you know, hard for connections. Um, that's something that I've been, uh, focusing on. Uh, other than that, I have done, uh, some productions also virtually. Um, I got to work with, uh, Regina Taylor, uh, and who partnered with the St. Louis Repertory Theater to do uh, Love and Kindness during the time of uh, quarantine, um, which was kind of like a, uh, it was a live event that we recorded and then kind of put together in a more cinematic uh, presentation and then was streamed. And also um, a few actually like live productions as well um, using uh, probably like OBS as a door, things like that to try and um, to do virtual performances. 
Um, and yeah, I think that's that's a, the gist of what I've been doing this time. Yeah, that's really great. I, I got to check out um, Love in a Time of Quarantine, and I think that if we post the link in the chat, other people should take a chance to look at that. It's really quite wonderful. It's great work. Yeah, yeah big, big shout out to Regina Taylor, who's doing work at um, SMU uh, with, with a project called The Black Album, which is really exciting. So the floor is yours. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, so yeah, in the next hour, I would just like to take the time to talk about myself a little bit because um, it's an important part of uh, understanding this work. I'd also want to take some time to talk about my family, my family home, which is a, which is also an, in, an integral part of uh, the work that I'm going to display and uh, what inspired me to create this piece, who helped me get there. Uh, I'll go over the process of creating and performing the work, uh, the value that I see in it and continuing it. And uh, finally, you're actually gonna get a chance to, to actually see the work as well. Um, and after that, I hope there will be time for questions uh, if there are any. So, um, who am I? We did a you know brief introduction there, but um, who am I and what are the experiences that shape my understanding of the world and what value is inherently within that view? Uh, that was the first question that I had uh, starting this journey to create this project. And um, I'm an American projection designer working mainly in theater. We talked about my work in dance and opera as well. Uh, I've been increasingly uh, trying to work more in a visual art capacity as well. And um, I've been studying uh, theater and working in the theater industry for about 15 years now, which is crazy to kind of say and hear um, and makes me feel older than I feel like I am, but it's been um, a great journey. And uh, I started my career more as a, as a technician actually. And then um, recently in the past few years, I've, shifted my uh, focus to design, which brought to, brought me to actually some interesting questions about who I am as a person and an artist and who I wanted to kind of present myself out uh, to the world as, as an artist. And um, those questions just continuously brought me to, you know, one place and, and one person. And so to kind of think more about the significance of that, uh, we have to dive just a little bit deeper into the history of my family. And so I come from what I consider to be a fantastic line of storytellers. Uh, my father, Albert Bland, and his identical twin brother, Alfred Brand, uh, Bland, uh, bought their first cameras when they were teenagers, and they quickly fell in love with the craft and from a young age seemed to really understand the importance of uh, capturing life and uh, the stories that images can tell. This is no doubt aided by the fact that around that same time, they were fully independent. Uh, they had lost their parents earlier in life due to heart disease and strokes. Um, despite this, and perhaps in spite of it as well, um, life really poured out of them. And I think that appreciation and attention for life was visible in the photos they took. Um, during that time, New York and the people of New York was their uh, subject, you know. Uh, and I think that it was only natural that when my father had it, family of his own, uh, that that next great subject would then be capturing every precious moment and documenting every moment of the development of that family. And that's exactly uh, what he did. So this is how my family and also my uncle became the archivist of my family. And um, I my, my parents have two children, of which I am the oldest. Uh, we moved to Georgia from New York City when I was about two years old and uh, from the ground up built then our family home, our, our then family home in Alfreda, Georgia, which was no small feat for the uh, new, uh, newlywed uh, black couple, leaving their family and their roots behind to start, start anew in a predominantly white suburb of Georgia, um, which had its own um, interesting um, uh, struggles and, and tasks about that. And then, um, that move was greatly born out of a great amount of ambition and desire, I think, a desire to have a home, uh, a family, and to live happily. And this was their own personal great migration in search of the American dream, uh, although be it in the context of history, kind of um, in reverse. <laughs> um, 
but my so my father actually passed away when I was 18 years old. And uh, like many families in the recession uh, of the early aughts in America, uh, we also um, had to leave our family home. And so we lost that place that I know was intended to hold hopes and dreams of not only like this man, this figure that I will uh, continue to talk about in my piece, but also a family. And so uh, that loss of a parent, a home and an archivist, which I will get into more, um, is this huge shift in my life and kind of my first understanding of my like personal and familial legacy. And the author, Christine Sharp, uh, in her novel, in the wake on being on blackness and being sorry uh defines this as the wake uh, a term that i wholeheartedly agree with in every context of the word and i'm going to give you uh several of the definitions that she goes through uh, the first one is the wake which is the state of wakefulness and consciousness uh the second is a watch or vigil beside the body of someone who has died, sometimes accompanied by ritual observances, including eating and drinking. The third definition would be grief, celebration, memory, and those among the living who, through ritual, mourn their passing and celebrate their life in particular, the watching of relatives and friends beside the body of a dead person from death to burial, and then drinking, feasting, and other observances incidental to this. Uh, Sharp, while relating to the first definition that I talked about, um, really says it great, where she says, um, with this sense of wakefulness and consciousness that most of my family lived and awareness of it as and in the wake of the unfinished project of emancipation. I'm going to try to take that again because I kind of bungled it. <laughs> um, so what she's saying is that this sense of wakefulness and consciousness was a major part of how her family uh, was aware of itself as a unit and was also um, the wake and was obviously a, a huge part of the wake of the unfinished project of their emancipation. I think that's a little bit better. <laughs> and so my story, Smile, is a continuation of my, my own family's emancipation. With it, I present the story of a man whose life was dedicated to the freedom of his family uh, and also freedom from the cycles that were visited upon him, a recognition of that work that was left unfinished in a celebration of a black family, my family, and also in recognition of our humanity and the importance of archiving and championing black lives and black stories. Um, to quote another person who I think is a brilliant mind, uh, C. Riley Snorton, to be not fully human, which seems to also mean to be something else, other, and to survive, which means to be in excess or perhaps outside of life, is a peculiarly black problem. Um, and that's a really interesting thing that I've like pondered about when thinking about um, how black lives are, are documented, archived, and shown socially or uh, in the media or through ads and, and things like that. And so that kind of, feeds into um, why I decided to create this piece. So um, my father's love for photography and film was a profound influence on how I perceived the world. And I attribute those values very much so as to why I was drawn to the art of storytelling and specifically theater. So when I set out to start my career in this industry, I, I quickly noticed a few things. and. Uh, First, that there were not many people of color that were designers or technicians in my field. Um, I also realized that there were an even smaller portion of people that I would say are black women or women of color who are designers and technicians in the field. And then last, uh, there is an almost uh, seemingly non-existent quotient of people that identify as myself, which would be then be black queer women in the industry in the field that I have chosen. Um, Another important thing that I, that I that I feel about being a designer is that um, as a designer, I think that you get a infinite amount of chances to 
champion the stories of others. And whether fictional or real, you get to draw upon your unique perspective as an artist to celebrate the journey of another person, uh, people, or ideals. And uh, and I, it comes it came to no surprise to me, of course, that the majority of those stories being told are usually those of whiteness. And I can only speak from my perspective as an American, but I see this prevalence, like I said, in our films, in our photography, in our media, in our hospitals, in our schools, in our algorithms, and in our minds. Uh, uh, Christine Sharp, who probably with the last of her quotes, I promise, uh, but she brilliantly states that uh, Black exclusion from social, political, cultural belonging is an, is an objection from the realm of the human. So here I am uh, at the beginning of my, my career, declaring myself to the world as an artist uh, in a field in which I see no reflection of myself really in that industry. And so I keep asking myself these questions of who, I, uh, who am I? Why does my voice matter? Uh, and, and what is my place as an artist in this world? And so uh, it was at that moment in time that I really knew that the most important story that I had in me to tell was my own and that the process of uh, creating this work and uh, would, would be a healing journey, not only for me, but also could stand as a kind of humanist approach to uh, my artwork. Um, so every great project starts with research and uh, I've shared many quotes by Christine Sharp, um, and uh, please read her book, it's amazing. Uh, I think she actually has several books, <laughs> um, but she talks a lot, she really examines the commodification of, of black lives in art and, and likens it to the different sections of uh, the slave ship. Um, she talks about the wake, which I uh, touched on a bit before, the ship, the hold, and the weather, and uses that kind of as a, as a framework to tackle anti-blackness and white supremacy. And it's, it's, really, a, it's really a fascinating read. Um, I also checked out uh, Audre Lorde's, and I may butcher, I think it's Zamy, a new spelling of my name, uh, as a reference for how people are owning and cultivating their own history and their own stories, but also adding a uh, mythos about them, which was really interesting to see. And um, I really want to honor one of my mentors, uh, Thomas Allen Harris, who uh, has a company called Family Pictures USA and a PBS show, I think also by the, the same name, um, where he goes upon, he gives people really the opportunity to um, tell their own stories. He travels from city to city, asking them to bring their archives. And that could be, you know, anything. There are many things that could be considered uh, archives. If your family has a history of quilts, you know, that's an archive that has uh, intimacy and a story to tell. Um, and um, mainly though, this, this show and that subject is about photographs. And so I had the chance to write an article for him. Um, I also uh, took a course with him. And um, it was really interesting to see how humanizing and engaging that, that uh, his work is and the framework of like sharing family stories is. And that really helped me to find, to see the find and see the value in my own archive and um, push kind of the process of uh, starting this project forward. And uh, so talking about the process, um, so to, create this, I, I had to go home. Uh, as I mentioned, um, my father took many pictures. There are boxes and boxes and piles and crates and kind of just like, uh, you know, every sort imagined of hundreds and thousands of photographs uh, capturing pretty much every moment of uh, my family's life up until like the moment of, of my father's passing. Um, and going through, I, I sat with my mother and we actually went through all of them. And uh, that experience alone was was uh, worthwhile. But I, I knew somewhat what I was looking for. Um, but I also knew that there are many things that I probably did not understand or needed to know more about. And so I kind of went through, well, we went through and found those items, found those photos and uh, Kind of collected them and I packed them, uh, cradled them in a suitcase and took them back home with me uh, to, to New Haven for further investigation. Um, so out of those like thousands of images, I think I took like a hundred home. Um, and so uh, 
And when I got home, I proceeded to immediately be completely overwhelmed by the task. Um, I had, you know, a lot of struggle. There, there was a huge struggle to figure out, you know, what what the path forward was, what the story I actually wanted to tell was, what images were important to me, why I should, should display them, how I should display them, um, all of these things. And uh, my partner, being the brilliant woman that she is and knowing that I'm a visual person, uh, gave the brilliant suggestion that I should just lay them all out. Um, so I actually filled up our entire living room with all of the pictures uh, all over the floor and then just stared at them for like uh, at least an hour. And through that, I was actually able to see a story come through. That story really arose. And I, I saw my parents. Um, I saw a love that bore a child. I saw a child that needed a home. I saw a beautiful family with a promising future. And I also saw a void. Um, and so to rebuild that void um, and to kind of give context to it was the task that I kind of, that I set at hand. And in order to do that, I then actually started uh, doing phone interviews with my family. I would give them the uh, digital scans of the pictures ahead of time, and then we would talk about them, you know. Um, and I chose the images. I chose images to show to them that you know I had a lot of questions about that I um, wanted more context on, uh, and that I thought also in my own mind in the story that I was uh, also creating kind of like fit into that narrative, and that worked sometimes. And and, and uh, I got um, uh, amazing answers, and uh, and also things that I didn't you know expect to get, and, um, and that was actually really wonderful. So after that process, I had about a few hours of, of audio um, interviews that I had to go through. And uh, the one with my mother is the one that you will hear later today, um, who was absolutely brilliant and, uh, and, and did that just kind of off the cusp. And I just enjoyed her interview so much uh, that it became like the, you know, one of the primary uh, portions of the piece. So, um, at this last moment after I had the interviews and I had the photos and I had an idea uh, of what I wanted to tell and I had shortened it down actually to about 15 minutes the interview. Uh, the other thing that I was really faced with was this fragmented idea of home and the memories that a space could hold. So I then persisted to use Google Maps uh, to rebuild my house. Uh, I made like a basic uh, model um, out of out of uh, geez, I think it was like out of like a, a foam foam board uh, to reconstruct the house in reasonably um, accurate dimensions. Uh, and then, so of course, came the time for the performance. And so I knew that there were some things that were really, really important to me uh, as a projection designer. Um, I thought that my medium, and uh, I, I do believe that my that the medium resonates very closely to both the realm of the ephemeral and the ethereal. Um, and that also kind of really speaks to the nature of memory to me. And uh, com combining, so combining that nature of projection design with my actual personal memories uh, really fascinated me. So I decided that um, what would be projected are the uh, are the photos that that I had with me, and projecting them and not doing something on like a screen, uh, like, a, like a video screen, or uh, LEDs or something like that, or um, some other technique. Uh, what was important, just like actually projecting um, uh, the work. So, um, so I, I also really enjoyed the experience um, uh, that putting that piece together, and I personally really enjoy going to product, uh, productions that expose kind of the process of what it is that you're doing. Uh, a memorable company to me that stands out. Um, which I'm of course going to uh, forget because it's so memorable. Um, oh man, the puppet company from Chicago. Um, all I can think of was Moment Factory right now, but um, I'll think of it later. I'm so sorry. Um, but there's a company from Chicago that does uh, shadow puppetry uh, in a very cinematic way, and they kind of expose not only the uh, creation of it, but uh, but then li uh, live project the creation of on a more cinematic kind of landscape. And I've always really, really enjoyed that. And um, so I decided to actually uh, mimic that presentation style. 
Um, I also thought that it was really important for uh, myself to be in the piece and uh, to have this layered experience where you're watching a cinematic version of a story that's being told. You're also watching the creation of that cinematic journey that's being told. And you're also watching the person whose actual life it is actually uh, literally managing uh, their history um, um, live in this experience. I thought that was actually a really important thing to see as well. Um, so the room uh, consisted of an animation coffee stand that I put uh, some clean white paper over. Uh, and then I had a camera that I was using uh, on the on the coffee stand pointing down at the at the surface. Uh, and then I used touch I used touch designer to facilitate uh, to facilitate the live capture of the of of what I would, of myself handling the the photos, but also of the audio playback that was happening during the show. Um, so yeah, that was like a that was the kind of basic uh, setup of which will become a little bit more clear once you can actually see the piece. Um, and so yeah, so what I would do is play the interview and then curate an experience uh, that was a little different every time by live setting out the photos of my archive to help uh, add a layer to the like the auditory uh, narrative that was happening, add a visual element to that as well. Um, and so um, I, I do think that reflecting the world back at itself really is a enriching thing that people do. And um, sorry, one second. And so, um, uh, well, actually, the, the responses of this of this piece were actually really phenomenal. Uh, people that I knew really enjoyed it. Um, people that I did not know and did not know me really enjoyed it. Um, and I think that there are natural connections to individuals and communities uh, that are creating uh, that are creating work about themselves and doing communal storytelling and communal empathy. I think this is also a really, um, really great tool for people who are also uh, considered like have marginalized voices and um, are really trying to get the, their word out there and their voices out there. Um, I'm hoping that I could expand this piece a little bit more. Um, I mentioned Audre Lorde and I really enjoy the sense of mythos that she creates around her own personal story. And I'm, I'm loving the idea of that. And I want to uh, expand on that a little further. Um, and I also love to, um, for the future of this is just to create more uh, site specific uh, documentary theater pieces that help uplift the voices and stories of individuals and communities. Um, I actually think the theaters are perfect for this because they're often um, champions of, of, of the local communities that they are in. Uh, and so that they're perfectly situated to, um, to help strengthen people's uh, uh, voices and their truth and project that into the world. Projection pun, totally meant. Um, and so the desired outcome of this would be uh, personal and communal um, empathy and a shared healing experience, which I think uh, I think now more than ever because of many things uh, is is really needed. Um, so I I would love to share the piece with you, um, and it's about like fifteen minutes long, so we can go ahead and watch that, uh, and then yes, um, I'll let Andrew take it away from there. <laughs> okay, so I think my earliest childhood memory was really like, like maybe first or second grade, and I think it had to be some special day because I was all dressed up um, and I, I was the center of attention, which is kind of hard being a little kid growing up. So um, I just remember being dressed up and getting all the attention, having my pictures taken <laughs> and um, it just felt special. But I really remember the, the, the younger days of being in school with um, a best friend who was your godmother, who. Millie? <laughs> yeah. And would 
Melody and I, who, you know, we were friends from early first years of elementary school and um, just spending a lot of time with her and her spending a lot of time with me. And she became like an extension of my family. She became like a sister um, that I didn't have. Um, even though I had one, she was older. So we kind of really bonded as, um, as young as, you know, second grade and still have that connection to this day. So I have some really good memories of spending time with her family and her spending time with us, with our family. Oh my God, where did you find this picture? I'm scrolling through. You have a picture of me and my brother, John. Yeah, you're playing uh, on the piano or something? Yeah, I got that little piano organ for Christmas. That was Christmas day. Oh my God, really? Yes. Oh my gosh. Wow. Yeah, I found, I found one, one picture that's basically falling apart of Albert and Alfred number one. Alfred and Albert make it. Because that was their dad's brother mm -hmm. who had twins. Not their dad had twin brothers. Not their mom. Their dad had the twin brothers. Oh, okay. So your grandfather had twin brothers. Remember um your grandmother Estelle? Yes, I do. Did you? I don't know if I sent you the picture of her, but she's got like this big hat on, and uh, it says the med is right above her house. She's got this big hat and big coat. Right. Those were her sons, Albert and Alfred. Okay. And your dad was her. Your granddad was her other son, and he ended up having Albert and Alfred, <laughs> the twins. Um. I know I've probably heard from Alfred a whole bunch of times, but do you remember what it was like to like know them as, as like the unit, <laughs> the twins? <laughs> to know them as the two? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, well, it was very, very close as you might imagine. Mm -hmm. And very protective of each other. Um, and just, they were, like, they were each other's, um, the, the world circled around them, in other words. They were, it was them up against the world, if, if you, you know, because once the other siblings left, it was just the two of them when they were young teenagers. You know, the mom was passed and their dad had passed. And as they got old enough, it was just the two of them living on their own, um, which is when I kind of met them. They were living by themselves in high school. And uh, so it was just a very, um, close bond that they had. And it was hard for them to let other people in. <laughs> so it was um, interesting and, and challenging to, to, to actually deal with twins, uh, identical twins too. So, um, but, you know, love conquers, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, over time, I guess I gained out this trust as well as um, your dad, you know? So, yeah. It was hard to not think that, like, he had, you know, his dream. You know, his dream for, for you and for, for me and for, like, the family. And he was just trying to, to make that, that a reality, too. Oh, I think the house was a huge part of it, you know? I think coming from the city, um, 
made him have a different dream, I think. I don't, I don't know if, if he had that kind of dream. He had a dream of family and, and me and him and kids, but I don't know that until we actually left the city that he had the dream of the house, a home, and um, you know, living in a community like that. I think once we got here, that that all became something he really wanted to do and um, strive to make a family and a real home for us. Yeah. <clears throat> Why do you think he photographed all of these moments? <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, I would, even though I know there was just an introduction of, of cameras to them as young kids, their dad got some cameras and that was, you know, their introduction and just taking pictures. I mean, we've all had that. We've all been given a camera at some point in our time, but we don't all take it up to um, what well, he made it. And I think he somehow knew the importance of capturing these memories. Um, and I, I like to think that he knew how important it would be for us to be able to uh, look back at these memories and just and have them yes we have them mentally but also we have them visually mm -hmm. and I don't know what part of him made him want to do that but it was a very special thing that he um it was a passion for him it wasn't just a job it wasn't just a habit or a hobby it was a passion that, along with his storytelling, his pictures told a story. And he wasn't so much the one who wanted posed pictures. He was all uh, more about the candid picture. So he'd take a picture, you know, of you without you knowing it or whoop, you knowing it. But he captured an essence of people that they never knew was there. Um, and you know how people say, oh, don't take my picture. I don't take good pictures. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no one, after seeing the pictures he took, they, they, they could no longer say that because he had that gift. He had that passion. He could capture something in you that no one else had, had captured in, as, as your soul, your essence of who you were. And that was just a gift he was given. Well, I think sometimes it's like they're living in your room to be just you. And that you always just had to smile. And it's funny because even even now, I mean, that woman said it when we were here, you know, she's like, oh, I see Brittany all the time. She's always smiling. She's always mm -hmm. like, you know, happy. But I don't think that that's, that's like the truth. And it's just like, you know, what we output into the world, you know. Well, I think so it's almost conditioning to some, but I think in your essence, mm -hmm. you are very laid back, and that can come across as always happy mm -hmm. because you don't um, always express your anger. That doesn't mean you don't have it, it just means you're not showing it, you're mm -hmm. not expressing it, and that's in your nature to you are not more you are less expressive and you all have it. that's not you know you, you didn't just become that you you just you just don't exhibit it like other people do so people can say that but she's always happy she's always pleasant she's always smiling I think i'm at fault too when i do it is um my thing is that I don't show my weakness. So people think I'm strong when I'm not necessarily strong. It's just that I'm not showing you my weakness. So mm -hmm. a perfect example, example of that is when your dad got sick and had a stroke. And people would say to me all the time, you're so strong. 
that's so strong. I don't know how you do it. Oh my God, you're just a hero. You're just and and inside my my world is crumbling, and they don't even see that because I'm putting on a strong face. Um. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think for I mean, part of the reason I want to do this project because I think we a long time just to. Sorry. Even why? I've been trying to just carry on, you know, just keep going on. Just keep going, and it's not. It's not. It hasn't resolved anything. So it's so there. It doesn't help to to just hold on to it for all this time. For these twelve years, I feel like I had it. I still haven't. You haven't actually stopped to 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 actually feel the real pain and the loss and and the joy. I don't think um, I don't think any of us really, you know, stop. Um, you know, to 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 really. <laughs> absorb or, or or you know console what, what we have experienced what we had and what we no longer have and i think he would say um, that he's grateful to have had the years that he did have with you and your brother i know he would be grateful to have had that opportunity. Um, he would say that he is sad that he was taken away from us, um, that he would wish he could reverse it if he could. And um, that he wishes he could have been here for more of those special times that he hasn't been, um, that he is so clearly missed and it probably breaks his heart that he cannot be here at these times. But I think he has done great things for us in his absence. And even in this healing project that you're working on, it's because of him. And he would probably say, if this is what it takes for you to heal, then all of those pictures were worth every bit, every <laughs> moment, every single one of them was worth it. If this is what it does. Perfect. So that was that was really wonderful. Thank you for for sharing that. It's very intimate, very personal story, and really really touching. So it's really really great of you to share that, and I think that's really could be really inspiring to a lot of people to to like you're saying bring out and share their own stories. So I think that that's that's really great. So thank you, thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, thank you for giving me the opportunity to share. Yeah, uh, yeah. So I'm. Just a reminder: anybody has any questions along the way, feel free to throw them in the chat. We'll. Uh, I just. I. I. I think I. I would just want to start because the process of putting this together and having like thousands of photos and so many hours of interview conversation. It seems like 
an impressively staggering amount of work to go through and to create a story out of that. So I'm curious, just from a, like a technical standpoint, how do you how do you contain all of that information and how do you choose to what how do you archive this in a way that will be useful to you in order to create a show like this? Yeah, uh, yeah, it was it was a, a huge task. And um, I mean, I think that what was really important was to kind of like once I did find the the through line of what I wanted, I had to really uh, hold on to that. And, and also some of it honestly was you had to feel your way through it. You know, you would you would have an idea. I would have an idea of, of where I was going with something um, over, you know, the, the interview with my mother was two hours long. Um, and I, you know, had to cut it down to like 15 minutes. So I would have an idea of what I wanted, but then listening to it, you know, back again, uh, I just had to be really, really organic and, you know, just do what, what, uh, felt right. I know it's like the, you know, the least, uh, technical and structured thing, but in, in a project just like this, I think it's really, um, important to just be authentic with yourself and, and, and let uh really let your your heart and your mind kind of like take the lead for that and um yeah yeah i hope i hope that answered your question and and are you also talking about like how do you technically actually record and preserve and all those things yeah i think i think that i mean this the the symposium as a whole is about digital tools that's one of the yeah, main, main processes yeah, of yeah, it yeah. so i i'm always kind of curious if there's like anything in particular that you you used in order to keep tabs on it or is there something looking back on it that you're like oh well this was a terrible idea and I would go back if I was doing this again I would <laughs> use this tool or try to figure something else different yeah yeah um honestly I, I'd never worked with sound a lot and I most definitely had to go through and learn uh some some techniques there and so uh I actually had to learn audition to uh really kind of get like like the room kind of like the room noise down actually my mother's uh uh, recording was like really noisy. So it's amazing that I got it down to exactly what it was there. Um, and then um, uh, Touch Designer was actually a really great low latency tool. Um, I also, I'd, I'd seen out some other um, opportunities, some other software, and uh, that one just kind of seemed like the way to go. I would think that um, the house, the house is something that is somewhat unexplored. Um, you can kind of see it off on the side, maybe because of how <laughs> on export I felt that it was. Um, and I actually projected uh, into the house this like um, I, I, I had mapped the, I taken a picture of it and mapped it um, inside Touch Designer and um, uh, chopped up photos so they would fit inside this model of the rooms of the house that I had. So it was like memories uh, projected into the house. And that's something that I would actually really love to take further with uh, uh, with, more, with like more thinking and more, more tools at my disposal. I think that that whole uh, concept could be much larger and in a different uh, version of this piece. It could be explored technically even more. Um, the actual like filming of the of the of what's going on on the copy stand and projecting that is actually quite simple um, uh, as far as like touch designer goes uh, but I would want to do something way more elaborate if I had another chance to um, explore that using touch designer to kind of explore the idea of home and fragmentation like a lot more in a much broader sense mm -hmm. yeah I could I could see something like that being really interesting as a as an actual installation or something that could be big yeah. you could walk inside of yeah exactly uh, yeah that that in watching it i i was i was so focused on in the video when watching you and the screen that you were projecting onto that every so often I, my eyes went back to it. i was like oh something's happening on the house but it wasn't it's definitely not the focus in this particular video but i'm wondering if in the presentation the live aspect of it people mm -hmm. were much more able to see it <laughs> and it was they were yeah 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 and the live i mean I, I may not even in the the recorded version i may be cutting to something but like you can actually see me physically move and like open like the the front part of the house and then like okay. uh and then and then like there are cues that start rolling like inside of the house so uh in in the actual room it's much more obvious that there needs to be attention 
paid to that object. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, I think like uh, yeah, the biggest thing that I did not, uh, that I would touch on more is that idea and, um, and looking for ways to even in like, maybe even like a several room setup where the first thing is that you go in and you have an installation that explores like the home and the uh, memories and ideas that were inside the home, you actually fragment that and um, and and do different kind of either snippets of, of different like memories. I, I, I One thing I didn't do, which would have been cool is like, I also got a whole bunch of tapes. We have like a whole bunch of home videos okay. um, and it would have been interesting to digitize those actually, and then be able to throw those at, a, at an installation of the home and then you live in that and move into another section which is actually the presentation of me and the photos and like all of these things uh and connecting in that way like that would be that would be a really interesting way to kind of like continue this project and and, and move it forward and it's something that, I, that I, i'm definitely thinking about and would be a much uh, uh bigger uh, technical feat and i'm like uh, like, like I said, I come from from a uh, as a technic from working as a technician. So, like, I really wanted to explore more um, advanced tools, and um, and I think that the uh, the presence of being in the room and just like telling the story uh, took supremacy for this iteration. But uh, that is totally something that I, I want to expand on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it really takes the idea of it being an uh, like an archive of your family life. And could take it so much further if you had access to video and audio yeah, and photos. Yeah. yeah. And you just layer it on and people can see the entirety of your stories. Could be really yeah. beautiful. Um, I have a question from the audience asking uh, they're curious how the show and your relationship to the material transformed as you created and shared the work. Uh yeah, I mean this was this was a huge moment. So actually I I graduated like two weeks after showing this presentation um, from grad school. And uh, so my family came to the graduation and I was actually able, because the space that it was in, uh, no one was gonna be in there. So I just kept it up and then I actually showed it to my entire family on my graduation day. And uh, it was uh, emotional to say the least. Uh, and, <laughs> yeah. um, and, and actually a, a huge uh, uh, healing, healing experience, I think for, for all of us. So I think that um, for me, it was healing for myself personally, uh, but also, I mean, it was great to just kind of like show that aspect of myself and also of, of uh, a family member that everyone knew and had a relationship to and uh, bring all of us together. And I actually had some uh, some friends who brought also their parents too. Um, and so it was just kind of like, you know, I think everyone everyone at some point in their, loss, um, in their life will experience some kind of loss. And it was uh, really healing for, for just about anyone that, that saw it. And so my, my, relationship, my relationship to the materials deepened um, because actually before this, um, it was more kind of just like in a, in a box, you know, for a really long time. And it meant a lot to kind of like pick up the mantle in that way of, of the archive and continue its life and, and consider like what it means to uh, um, give it new life. And yeah, it was also great for my family and friends as well. So, so you're thinking, I'm, I'm thinking maybe that as you've created it the first time and you shared it with the world now, if you were to take it and expand upon it, it's less raw, perhaps it's more that you can focus on maybe more detail or more, uh, I guess the technical side of it. Design. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was, I'm not sure it will. Uh, I'm not sure it'll ever not be a little raw, um, but but yeah, I think I think being able to have another aspect to it and then maybe double down on the raw experience would, would be really significant. And yeah, and yes, as you said, um, being able to kind of bring it like bring the vision to like new heights technically would be great. Hmm. Uh, you you mentioned in in your earlier presentation part of the presentation. Um, that exposing the process as part of this piece was really important that seeing you working and creating it live was really important to it can you can you expand on that a little bit Some yeah yeah i mean i've always been uh, uh someone who i think like 
uh, tries to manage their emotions like a lot. Um, and so it's, it's really interesting to um, be able to kind of share that extra layer to the process. I think that being able to see someone not only like, you know, preciously hold an archive that actually has a great deal of power to them and being able to see them actively manipulate those items and then also uh, provide like a more cinematic experience. I think that is actually integral to like the relationship that uh, the viewer has with the whole, uh, with the whole show. Um, I think that like uh, you, I think that me actually being there, like if I wasn't there, that it would just kind of be a showcase of a thing, uh, a showcase of a piece that I think is actually very, very heartfelt. But I think that the added um, layer of of uh, of myself actually being able to manipulate those items, uh, I don't know. It, it just it just provides a more human layer to it. And the fact that the the photographs themselves are analog, they're not a digital uh, uh, representation of them, um, and that they are the originals, um, which which might change in the future because they have to be preserved. Um, but um, but I think that that's that's just like. Um, Probably one of the more the more humanist aspects of it. Cool. And um, I was actually now that just clocked something else that I was really curious about the in in the actual performance you you said that there was a little bit of uh, a little bit of improvisation in terms of it changing from one night to another, one performance to another in terms of you placing the photos. What would have struck you in order to like change those moments? What what would have been the impetus to change in the moment? Um, so I mean, uh, as you can see, it's I'm very particular as to like how they're being like laid down, uh, their position, and and like who's next to who, so that you can show more of a direct relationship to. Uh, to, to like the uh, what's what you're hearing, but also like the photo photographs relationship to each other, um, and that was um, honestly just kind of like how I was feeling that day. Also, uh, the photos got mixed up, <laughs> um, so um, as, as as I was going through, they wouldn't always be in the same uh, in the same order, which actually was really thrilling for me because you could still um kind of like improvise and figure out what was right for that moment and um and figure okay well if i lay this down at this time um like how does that affect like the, the impact of this image and if i place it here how does that affect the impact of, of that image and it was really as as i kept performing it i kept kind of like a feeling the responses of the people in the room and how they're responding to what's going on. Uh, and then also um, kind of increasing my understanding of like the narrative of what's happening and my and how I felt about it. And so each time everything would change just a bit and also the order of the, of the photos kind of shuffled a bit. Um, and so it became um, really interesting to kind of like keep a through line um, and, but also deal with that kind of um, you know that kind of slightly randomized uh photos mm -hmm. is this is this your first time performing is yeah this, yeah how did yeah, that yeah. feel huh how did that feel <laughs> <laughs> uh I, I i considered uh i did not break down at any point during this process which was fantastic um and um yeah, I, I'd, I'd never really been on stage before, and that was that was um, that was the thing. You know, it was actually really nerve wracking, uh, as you know, I'm always like off behind the scenes or gone by the time the show opens or like doing something else. And to be so like present was was interesting. I got a few people that said that I should have like dressed up as like one of the photos. Like, there's one that is like a teenage mutant ninja turtle like pajamas. Then they were like, that would have been great. And, like, so I think there's like an element of uh, of uh, of like owning the performance that I could totally um, um, heighten there because this is like the first time I'd ever like like uh, do anything. And I actually, um, you know, I'm, I'm actively working, but I'm also kind of like super nervous. So I'm just like hyper focused on like the table and and how I'm like doing things. And I like don't even, 
I, I didn't turn around or anything until like the very end. And at the very end, I do like, like a half bow. I'm like, oh, I don't know what I'm, I thank you, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're coming to this very emotional thing, you know. Um, so yeah, there's just definitely an aspect of, of, uh, of performing that I could totally take some cues on. <laughs> Uh, on that note, actually, another question from the chat is uh, this person's interested in knowing a bit more about the decision to not speak. So we yeah. hear you and your mother's voice in recording, but as I understand your presence in the performance is silent. It is silent. Yeah. Um, and and that, that for me, I, I kind of, I don't know, I, I had done another uh, piece that was purely auditory. Um, and actually this harkens, this goes back to, uh, um, manual cinema, who is the company that I was trying to talk about earlier that does, that does shadow puppets, um, in Chicago. And, um, something that I really liked about their art form is like that there's, um, there's a cinematic experience going on. There's this kind of like elevated process that you can see. Um, and they're actually up until recently, they do have shows now with words in them, but, um, they, there's like only music. There's not, um, any actors or anything like actually speaking any words or anything like that. And so it really kind of like heightens your uh, ability to just focus on the narrative that that's, that that's my opinion is that, um, that heightens uh, your ability to focus on like the narrative that's being presented. Um, but, but going back and thinking about it, you know, I am trying to think about more ways to maybe include myself more. Um, and some of that is probably like my shyness of being um, a performer in that way. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, but it was, but I was completely signed through, through the whole piece. And I think that, um, that was a mix of trying to preserve like a style of performance that I really enjoyed, but then also uh, not being a performer and not quite knowing like what to say <laughs> uh, and, and trying to have like the piece really speak for itself. Yeah. I could, I could see, I mean, I was, as I was sitting through it, I was like, Oh, I wish Brittany was, was responding that it was a conversation with your mother in the, the audio recording. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah. So what we're having, so we're obviously having like a real conversation um, in the non-edited version. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I was just, I mean, part of it was also just so struck by this uh, um, conversation that I had with my mom that I, and, and, and so much of this piece, you know, you would think that is, is, is about my dad. And I really wanted to highlight her because she is actually really strong. And even though she talks about, you know, oh, I'm not always strong, whatever but she actually is really strong and really intelligent. And so I wanted to like, you know, have her be as present as him. And that, that way you knew that like there, it was a family unit and I'm not just glorifying one person who was gone, but also uh, one person who is here and is, is, is still a very active and vibrant part of my life. Mm -hmm. Well, that was definitely very clear. That was definitely her, her presence was very felt in the strength of it. So I think that part was very successful. Um, I'm also curious then about about your other work and then coming out of this project because this was a couple of years ago. It's like yeah, it's almost two years ago now. So coming out of that, what is uh, what have you taken into other works? Like what is what has been a like an aha moment for you? Oh, I gotta think about that one. Um... Actually, I, I actually, I just realized that I, I showed my brother's uh, infant naked body uh, to hundreds of people just now in one, one of the photos, and that was hilarious. I had a bit of like, aha, he's going to hate that. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so that was actually going to be my next question. I, was gonna, <laughs> I hadn't I was, written that I one down. I was like, oops. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, what's going on in that photo? Before we get back to the aha moment, oh, what's yeah. going on uh, in that photo? We had the chicken pox, um, oh. I, which was his fault. I I had never had it, um, and he of course got chicken pox. It's no one's fault. Your children, it happens. Whatever. Um, and so of course we had to take a picture of ourselves getting you know wrapped in like the it's like an oatmeal uh, kind of like lotion or something. Why that was necessary to take a picture of? Who knows? But apparently it was. Um, <laughs> and. <laughs> Thankfully, I was clothed. Um, so, but but it was just kind of like a hilarious thing that I found um, um, during that. 
And um, the 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 can you repeat the aha question just one more time because I went off on a tangent. Uh, it's it's more just uh, is is there anything in terms of your process, what you were doing, what you learned about your own creative process and state of mind that you would have taken forward into other work that you've done since then? Like what's like that? Oh, this was yeah. a really great thing to do. Yeah, um, honestly, the importance of um, of help. Uh, I think this being such a personal project, I thought that I needed to take it on all by myself. And I think that, like you know, no one does anything alone. And even though I needed to create this project that was very singularly about myself and my family, um, I still needed help, and I needed to kind of ex I needed to go through accepting that. Um, and so I actually got a, uh, a friend of mine who was a director, Logan Ellis. Um, we had worked together on another project and he was um, just so caring, caring and careful um, and mindful about how he approached the work that like when, when I decided to do this, you know, and that I needed help kind of like um, just having another eye on, on what the story that I was telling, uh, I approached him and, and had him um, help me with that. And I think that like asking for help during projects is something that like I don't always do and most definitely need to to work on. So it was really great to to like in, in a moment of vulnerability uh, have that be rewarded with, you know, the kindness of another and to be OK with being, you know, vulnerable in moments. Um, so th that that was kind of like, like an aha thing. And then um, I also um, just really, it, it really kind of illuminated to me the, the styles of productions that I really enjoy and the, styles, and the types of people that I love working with and, and helped me and has helped me actually kind of like pick the things and the projects that I want to work on more because I, I found more and more projects that I really, really connect with like the, the Regina Taylor thing um, with um, STL, uh, Love and Kindness in Quarantine. Uh, Regina had a story that was actually very closely to mine um in, in in that presentation and we just really connected over that and and the work that came out of that was so much richer because of it so there's really been um, um experiences since then that um, i've been able to really connect with other people because i've either shared the shared this work with them or i've just had this experience of creating this personal project and so i really understand um where they're coming from and i think that's that's also a very very valuable experience is always is always valuable mm -hmm. Yeah, it's never never an easy thing to just discover what that is that <laughs> really works well for you, like what your real choices of, yeah. of the work that you want to get into, especially if you just came out of school. Yeah. And that's, uh, yeah, it's really hard for a lot of people. And also asking for help. Those are both really good things to <laughs> just put out into the ether for the world to, to know. Ask for help. <laughs> Don't be stubborn. <laughs> especially in, in, like, in technical theater positions or in, like, hard these kind of jobs that we do, we often find ourselves being the person in the room who knows what exactly they're doing and what they want to accomplish. And we want to like hold on to that for ourselves. It's like my job. Yeah. My, but it's, you need to ask for help. So yeah. Like, yeah. It only makes it harder when you get to that spot where you just can't push forward. If you just mm -hmm. sort of like, no, I'm the one that has all the knowledge and there's always going to be someone uh, who knows more more about a subject than you, and um, and yeah, taking some like the bravado and kind of ego out of like asking for that is is super valuable, and you'll get the thing done, which is actually very useful too. <laughs> yeah. Because that is the end goal, I suppose. Let's get it done. Yeah, get it done. Uh, another question from the audience: uh, What is was the most surprising part of working with your family's archive? Uh, yeah, so there's actually like a family controversy uh, about our last name, um, which I won't go into in full detail, um, just to preserve. But uh, the most surprising thing about that was kind of discovering um, this like history between uh, um, my father's biological father and then uh, another half of our family. Um, and that there is this like whole story behind it that I, I'm still like trying to kind of like piece together. Um, but that was really surprising to find out. And sorry, I won't, I can't spill the tea on it. Um, <laughs> <but>, um... 
No, you already you already showed your brother naked. So I think yeah. that's enough yeah, yeah. family drama for one. Yeah. <laughs> one event. Uh, uh, that's yeah. That's great. Um, is this is this a kind of work? This kind of work. Will you will have you been sharing with? Do you share this with other people? And are you going to continue to push other not push but like offer as a as an opportunity to others? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I yeah, I've, I've I've shared this with other people. Um, I've shared it privately. This is uh, I think uh, this actually uh, is only the second time people have been able to actually see it in this way. Um, so um, I haven't shown it publicly too much. Um, and yeah, I'm I'm looking for other opportunities to do so. Um, I want to share it as much as possible, um, and you know, highlight the the process, and 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 also um, have as many opportunities as I can to kind of hone in on on what that process is, and and um, and kind of like figure out how to keep configuring uh, configuring uh, configuring it so that it's. Um, uh, al almost like a, a more useful process even for other people. I mean, I talked about Thomas Allen Harris and his Family Pictures USA, and he goes through and, and uh, travels and has people um, just tell their stories. And I think that's very useful. And I'm trying to figure out a way uh, uh, of my own approach that is a more kind of theatrical uh, slash cinematic hybrid of that that I could do not only for myself and expanding this piece, but I'd be super interested in like working with other people to like also do the same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this I could see this very easily turning to something that would have a large following of individuals who would come in with their own stories in order to help tell yeah. them in a theatrical sense and that you could build a, a, yeah. a sort of a series out of this. Yeah, kind kind of like the moth. Um, I don't know if anyone. So I think it's called the moth. Um, the moth might be a podcast, but it's basically people just come up and and tell stories to each other. Um, it's like it's basically like an open mic night. And uh, there's a podcast, but they also do like live versions of it in different cities, and it's really interesting. So like this combination of like the moth and uh, paying tribute to uh, Thomas Allen Harris's process. And then what I can also bring to the table um, is really interesting. Um, another question just came in for the chat. What are your thoughts on social media as an archive as opposed to physical photographs? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I I don't I don't knock social media as as an archive. I honestly think that um, archives could be, you know, anything. Uh, if you're if you had a family member. Like, uh, like I said, that like collected, like made quilts, you know, if there was like 10 quilts that they made throughout their life and those would tell a story. Um, if, if you have like, you know, a collection of like TikTok videos, uh, that, that are like an archive of like how someone was feeling like throughout their life. I mean, that's an archive. Um, if you, if you had, um, <laughs> it'd be interesting, but if you had like a sequence of like memes that someone curated and generated that, I think that could also be like a source of, uh, of, of, uh, that could also be an archive. I'm not, I'm not bigoted about it. I do, um, I do have, uh, I do think that physical things, tangible things, I think that there's something about that that's really interesting. Um, and I think that, I mean, being able to hold some, hold something that belonged to another person um, is is something that like, I don't know, that, that, that I'm, I personally miss the most. So having something like, I don't know, um, a tie something like that, like that, that, that just brings so much joy. And I think that like seeing photos and seeing videos and, um, and whatever future, um, forms of, um, social media or, uh, or media that, that becomes generated. I think those are every much as, as worthy of, of creating an archive, but I, as the person that I am, I just really love tangible things. Mm -hmm. I think uh, it actually came up in, in one conversation at the start of the symposium. Matt mm -hmm. Wendell was talking about his project that involved uh, trawling Facebook for all of the information about an, a particular person, and that that somehow could get used in this their kind of wacky VR uh, experience that's built around your particular life. But there's like the tools exist in order to digitally download that kind of information that somebody could 
put into maybe less of a uh, daunting story about your life if you wanted to use it in that way. So mm -hmm. there's interesting yeah. ways of uh, connecting it in with within touch designer and uh, like yeah. going through the guys. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that digital, uh, I mean, we're in a in an increasingly digital world and digital experiences um, are coming up more and more. And um, I think that they're really interesting. And um, and I, I work in a digital medium. So I'm always like at this like combat, like at this combat of like digital and then tangible, and digital and tangible. And I think that like the most successful things that I've seen um, are really able to bring in like the emotion and character of, of having something that is tangible. I think like if you can still get to the soul of that through a digital medium, then like go for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's always kind of funny, I think, keeping back to our first conversation two months ago where we started talking about like, well, what, what should be you present? And then we talked about this project and you're like, this is the least technical project. <laughs> that I've worked on in a long time and I'm like yeah. but it's but it's great it's really yeah. it's really important I think the everything about it is really important so I'm I, I just I mean we've got like 10 more minutes if anybody else has any other questions I think I would just ask uh about your other work if there's anything interesting you wanted to mention like your other projection work or um yeah um let's see what else have I been working on it's been a long year. Yeah, I just um, like putting in. <laughs> I'm like, what what else has happened this year? I kind of like can't remember past um yesterday. Um yeah, I, I would say that I've I've really enjoyed um working with uh with the St. Louis Repertory Theater. That was really interesting. Um, I've been doing more and more kind of like virtual theater productions and am trying to uh, figure out, trying to get into un Unreal and virtual and uh, VR and trying to figure out that out. Um, this has all been kind of just um, in my own personal practice. I don't have a project um, assigned to it or anything like that yet. That's something that, that, I've, been, uh, that, that I've been interested in. And um, I've got a couple of projects coming up, maybe, who knows, in pandemic world. Um, but um, yeah, I can't really speak to those just yet. Um, sorry, I'm floundering on that one. <laughs> That's fine. I, I totally pulled, put you on the spot there. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, I mean, this this has been this has been really great, and I'm really I'm really glad you were able to be here and share this with us and talk to us about your process. And and I and I hope that some some of those who are watching this are are able to see this as as a way to open themselves up and then believe that they can do it as well, that they can share their stories, and that maybe they've been thinking about it and wanting to you know delve into their family's history and share it with the world and now seeing that it's possible and it can be done in a really beautiful theatrical way that this will be a uh, an inspiration to them so so thank you thank you yeah. uh yeah so if uh you know i have anything else you want to uh share with the world i think we can uh we'll, we'll sign off here yeah, no, I just want to say thank you for the opportunity to share the work. Um, I think this is great. Uh, and yeah, if anyone has any questions, you can also check out my website. I'm sure it's somewhere on um, it's on, on this platform. My email is also on there. Um, and yeah, I just am very thankful for the opportunity to present it. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, if anybody wants to check out a uh, website, so you can uh, go on to our presenters page and find Brittany on there and click on Brittany's face and then you'll <laughs> go to Brittany's webpage. Uh, <laughs> so uh, yeah, so again, thank you, Brittany. This is great. Uh, thank you everybody uh, for coming out to watch us, uh, watch this today. And um, I'll just uh, let you all know that uh, this is our only event for today. Tomorrow we have uh, Legacy of Illuminations by Moment Factory presented by Simon Grant and Joel Adria. That's happening at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. And uh, in the evening we have our critical conversations about uh, 
uh, about interactivity, sorry. <laughs> what is interactivity? When is it needed in theater? Uh, so you can sign up for that on our website and we'll be doing some Miro boards again, talking about that in a round table format. Uh, if you can also check out tomorrow evening or tomorrow during the day, there's Recipe for Disaster. It's one of the events you can check on our live digital presentations page on the website. And uh, tomorrow evening, 8 p.m. Eastern, we have Free Falling Monthly. Uh, so check it out. And uh, thank you very much for all your time. Uh, if you've enjoyed this session or any of the other sessions, please, of course, donate to the ADC. You can do that through our website. It's a Donate Now button at the bottom of the page. Uh, or you can do that on the ADC's website or on CanadaHelps.org. Thank you so much for your time, and I'll see you anon. <laughs>